I want to read from the book of Acts chapter 1, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And I want to talk about power evangelism and what to do about evangelism in the 21st century. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and to us, and in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I just preached a message about world missions. This is a little bit more detail on the outreach of the church and who we are to be to a world that is lost and in need. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that it guides us, that it helps us, that it brings light in our darkness and instructs us and equips us. It even corrects us, Lord. And so we're so grateful that the Holy Spirit makes it real to us. We can understand it. It's simple and it's it's something that you want us to pay very much attention to because you said in your word, if you love me, you'll keep my word. And so, Lord, we love you. We want to keep your word. And I thank you for this message today that you've given to us so that we can learn all about this wonderful advance of the gospel in the world. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, amen. So all my, li all my Christian life, and that's been almost 40 years now, all of my Christian life nearly, I've been uh, very fascinated by the message of the gospel, fascinated because of what it has done for me, but fascinated uh, in, in light of its immense power. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God, the dunamis of God. I'm going to share a little bit about that in a moment. But I'm also, I have been so fascinated, and I've read so many books about great leaders, incredible uh, prophets, preachers, missionaries from all over the world and sent from the United States to the world and, and how they bring the message and how they share the gospel and the power associated with the gospel that you and I preach. There is the power of God that seems to be, in some ways and in, in some places among the church, uh, dreadfully absent. But it need not be because the Word of God tells us that you and I are the ambassadors of the gospel, and you and I can bring this gospel, and God will do amazing things when we share it with others, things like saving people from their sin, making a new creation out of people, a child of God, healing their bodies from sickness. Over here, we have many testimonies that are continuing to emerge. We have several new ones, miracles, because he is a God of miracles, how he delivers people from darkness and, and a demonization, how the Lord works and moves through you and I in the earth. There's a word that sums up this fascination for me, this fascination of the gospel, the power of God, the healing power of God. There's no healing in me. There's no uh, great power in my voice, but when we are attuned to the, the things of God, the ways of God, what he wants to, us to do and say, there is a power associated with it. And that word is evangelism. Say it with me. Evangelism. Now, that's a word most of us already know. It may be a little strange for some. It may even seem out of date for others, but it is not to me. Because it is a powerful word that means bringing the good news. But it, it, has, it has something attached to it, and that is the people that bring the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice in the word evangelism, there is angel right in the middle of it. Evangelism evangelism. It literally means angel-like messengers of God. 
Oh, you got it. Come on. Hallelujah. Angel-like messengers of God. Now, we don't see ourselves that way because many times we're diminished by word curses that you got to break off. Lies of the past that you got to get rid of. You are true sons and daughters of God now, and you are lights in this world and angel-like messengers. We're not angels yet, hallelujah, but we are angel-like messengers. We are the evangelists in evangelism. And you and I, as messengers to our generation, we are bringing the message of God. Look at your neighbor and say, you're bringing the message of God. The light of God in this world, the light of Jesus, it just doesn't have to be through our words. It can be through our actions. That's why I love to pray for the lost, pray when they're sick, and watch God heal them. Somebody say amen. How many know, I think it was Mother Teresa said that the world needs, needs to uh, see the gospel more than hear it. In other words, if you and I are actively participating in what God's plan is and his message in the world, we will be doing a lot more than we are talking. And so this is an action word, evangelism. But there is power associated with it. And this is, this is you know, when, when we think about being evangelists or angel-like messengers of God, we feel powerless. There's such an argument out there. There's such resistance. There's so much deception. So many people that resist the message of God. Well, it's no different than it was back in the day when the gospel first began to pre uh, be preached by those who followed Christ. And the resistance will always be there, and our message is still the same, but we cannot forget the power of God associated with the sharing of the gospel. Everybody say power. power. Look at your neighbor and say, you have power. You have dunamis not only to live holy, not only to live right, not only to have the right attitude, not only to believe what God wants you to believe and overcome and be blessed and all those things that I teach you quite often, but you have power in your words when you share about Jesus and what he's doing for others. This word power that we see, you shall receive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you is the word dunamis. And this word dunamis, it means heaven sent power. The very power of heaven is sent in and through you to touch others. Somebody say amen. This is the power that Jesus promised through the Holy Spirit. It literally means the source of supernatural ability, ability that we don't have, but it's God's super on our ability. It's God's supernatural power. It's God's super on our natural. Somebody say amen. And his authority to create God's light in the, in the darkness. The whole world lies in darkness. If you've ever been in a pitch, pitch black room where you can't see your hand in your face, that's what the world lies in uh, spiritually. But it's you and I, it, it, the flame of God, that lights, that ignites when we begin to walk in this dunamis power with the message of the gospel. It brings light and darkness, healing the sickness, salvation from human suffering and spiritual death. The gospel has created such blessing in the world, in every nation that it's preached in. And there have been, there have been people who have died, been martyrs for this this gospel message. And you and I can serve in that same vein. Maybe we won't be martyrs, but we will be persecuted, but it's okay because we not only have a message that brings the light of God, we have the power of God that shows the world who God really is. I mentioned a moment ago how I love to read about great servants of God in the past. Ordinary people like you and I who had an extraordinary devotion to Jesus 
and a, a call, they took the call of God seriously, and they began to act upon those promises that God says, right here, I will make you my witnesses. One of those great uh, people that I just love to read, he's written several books. He's gone on to be with the Lord many, many decades. But his name is Watchman Nee. Anybody, have any, has anybody, okay, all right, so that's good. He wrote a book, he's written many books, Body, Soul, Spirit, incredible book about the body, soul, and spirit. But he wrote a book titled Sit, Walk, Stand. Sit, Walk, Stand. That's a curious title, but it is about evangelism. It is about power evangelism. And remember, when we, as angel-like messengers, we just not only have a message, we have the power to back it up. And so I wanted to read to you this, uh, an excerpt from this book. It's very incredible because it, it sheds light on what evangelism, uh, power evangelism can be and how you and I as a church can unite uh, in, in showing this community who God really is. But Watchman Nee, he was a Chinese Christian minister, and he describes an outreach to an island off the South China coast. And this is what he says. There were seven in the ministering group, including a 16-year-old convert whom they called Brother Wu. The island was fairly large, containing about 6,000 homes. And Watchman Nee had a contact there, an old schoolmate, who was headmaster of the village school. But he refused to house the group when he discovered that they had come to preach the gospel. Finally, they found lodging with a Chinese herbalist who became their first convert. Preaching seemed quite fruitless, he goes on to say, on the island. And Ni nee discovered it was because of the dedication of the people to an idol they called Tawang. They were convinced of Ta Wang's power because on the day of his festival and parade each year, the weather was always near perfect. When is the procession this year, Young Wu? Remember the convert, young 16-year-old convert. When is the procession this year, Young Wu asked a group that had gathered to hear them preach. It is fixed for January 11th at 8 in the morning, was the reply. Then said the new convert boldly, I promise you that it will certainly rain on the 11th. Somebody say amen. I'm talking about power evangelism. At that, there was a, an outburst of cries from the crowd. That is enough. We don't want to hear any more preaching. If there is rain on the 11th, then your God is God. It almost sounds like Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal and Elijah, the prophet. Watchman Nee had been elsewhere in the village when this confrontation had taken place. And upon being informed about it, he saw the, that the situation was very serious and called the group to prayer. That's a wise leader, by the way. On the morning of the 11th, there was not a cloud in the sky. But during grace for breakfast, that is when they were praying for breakfast, sprinkles of rain began to fall. And these were followed by heavy rain. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Worshippers of the idol Ta Wang were so upset that they placed the idol in a chair, carried it outdoors uncustomarily, and hoping that this would stop the rain. Then the rain increased after only a short distance, and the carriers of the idol stumbled and fell, dropping the idol, fracturing its jaw and left arm. 
<laughs> a number of young people in response turned to Christ as a result of the rain coming in answer to prayer. But the elders of the village made divination and said that uh, the, the wrong day s somehow had been scheduled and chosen. And so the, the proper day of the procession, they made up a new day, they said should have been the 14th. And so Watchman Nee and his friends heard this, and they again went to prayer, asking God for rain on the 14th and for clear days for preaching until then. Hallelujah. That afternoon, the sky cleared, and on the good days that followed, there were 30 converts, it says. Of the crucial test day, Nee says, the 14th broke, another perfect day, and we had good meetings. As the evening approached, we went again at the appointed hour, and we quietly brought the matter to the Lord's remembrance. Not a minute late, his answer came with torrential rain and floods as before. The power of the idol over the islanders was broken. The enemy was defeated. Believers' prayer had brought a great victory. Conversions followed, and the impact upon the servants of God that were a part, just the six servants of God that were in that little missionary journey. Their lives were radically changed. And it was all birthed from a 16-year-old novice, just a new convert who didn't know any better but to challenge the idol worship. Somebody say amen. So what am I saying? What am I saying? Are these things past? Are these things non-existent today? Christians Today, I believe, have a challenge, and all of us have a challenge. We must not limit evangelism to just argument. Argument. Well, you know, you, you, we go on, we argue about this, and we argue about that. You know, what sins are really sins, and uh, you, we can just argue. No! We are not to argue with people about the gospel. We are to present the gospel of Jesus. When winning the lost, arguments many times can just be shot down. It's not until the power of God is demonstrated that people actually turn to him. You see, you and I are angel-like messengers. Say it with me. You and I are angel-like messengers. We are messengers of God. And we are the angels in evangelism. Hallelujah. You and I are the messengers, the emissaries in our day, in our generation, who shine with the power of God that accompanies the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I, are through Jesus Christ dwelling in us, we are possessors of the dunamis, the power of the Spirit of God that he has given to us, his supernatural ability to not only share the gospel with loving boldness, but we have the power to back it up up with healing, signs, miracles, and wonders. Here's how power evangelism works. Number one, power evangelism works when any of God's children take initiative. Say it with me. Take initiative in reaching the lost. There's a great saying I, I really love, and this isn't so much power evangelism. It could be if somebody's really an obnoxious person that you want to reach. Somebody say, amen, there's a, there's a, there could be a few. There are two ways to make friends, do something for someone else, or let them do something for you. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of power to do that. It just takes, Jesus said, be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. 
So you're all the time thinking about, God, how can I not only share the message, but how do you want to demonstrate the power of God? I, would think, I think all of us would agree that doing nothing to win lost friends, loved ones, work associates is unacceptable for sure, and none of us would disagree with that. But Watchman Nee and his six-member uh, team, they set out intentionally. Everybody say intentionally. They took initial action. Act, they took action, they took initiative to confront the lost of that island. They planned an evangelism invasion. Hallelujah. And so let me give you these points about how evangelism works in taking initiative. How did they take initiative? They took initiative through prayer. They prayed. They prayed. And so you take initiative, you find your target, and then you take initiative. Because God wants the whole world to be saved. So there's no doubt about evangelism and what we are to be doing and the power that is associated with it. But the moment we begin to pray, we take initiative through prayer. And the moment they began to pray over their planned journey, there was... There was this stirring on the inside, no question about it, that they were believing God for salvations, for miracles, for signs of God to be demonstrated. They didn't know what it would be, but they knew God would do something. Watchman Nee and his team took initiative in prayer. B, they did not grow discouraged when faced with opposition, but they became very resourceful. It could have been very discouraging that Watchman Nee's friend uh, of long ago said, no, I'm not going to lodge you because you're, you're going to be sharing the gospel. And rejection is sometimes part of our outreach and our efforts. But no, what did they do? They pressed on through the rejection, and they pressed through, and they worked even more vigorously, and of course they found lodging, and even the idol worship would have scared most of us, and, and many people would have gone back, well, it's just not working out. No, they persevered. How, much, how many know that evangelism takes perseverance? You, you have to be in it for the long haul. They prayed, they took initiative through prayer, they faced the opposition, and they didn't go discouraged. See, they took initiative to interact with their target audience. Now, I love being around Christians. Why? Because we talk the same language. We can shout hallelujah and not look silly. I tell you, we can do all kinds of things among us, and we can, we can just celebrate one another. But you go out there, it's a totally different culture. But you carry the glory of God. You carry the power of God. They took initiative and they interacted. It was fruitless almost at first, but God always has a key to the kingdom in other people. How many know Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Hallelujah. I give you the keys that unlock and they may not, you may not understand where they are, what it is, but this young, this young convert, Wu, he said, yeah, he, he looked at these people like David looked at Goliath. Who are you to defy the living God with an idol? That's how we have to look at it, because God is after their heart. Remember Jesus at Jacob's well? He's just resting. His disciples, they've gone into the, into the village to get food, to, who knows what else, and Jesus just sitting there, and up comes this woman. This woman, I mean, her life was a mess. And so Jesus engages her. He doesn't look down on her. He engages her knowing that her life is a mess. And he doesn't do it by doing a healing miracle for her. He just, he just said, get, can you get me a, a drink of water from the well? And this woman was very surprised because she was a Samaritan and he was a Jewish rabbi and, you know, those two don't mingle too often. And she said, 
you know, uh, why are you even speaking to me? And Jesus just brings the conversation. He distills it down to her need. She needs to be saved. And he, you can read about it in John chapter 4. What gift of power did Jesus use in that instance? He used the word, the gift of the word of knowledge. He had an insight about her. There was, there was something on the inside of him that, that spoke about her. And he said, he said, well, go and get your husband, knowing that she wasn't even married. And she said, well, I'm not, I'm not married. And Jesus said, you're right. You're not. You've had five husbands. You talk about a mess. You've had five husbands, and the man that you now are, you're living with a man that, you know, I'm sure people assumed was your husband. And boy, did that ever ignite something in her. See, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the power that you and I have access to in evangelism. Everybody say amen. This is what the Lord wants us to begin to operate in, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. See, Pastor Randy, I've never operated in. Well, this young woo, he didn't know anything about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there was a challenge that rose up on the inside of him. And at D, until we take initiative to reach the lost, we will seldom see the fruit that we desire. How does power evangelism work? Number two, power evangelism works when any, everybody say any, of God's children bring disruption to the lifestyles and to the lifestyle of the lost. Now, this isn't very fun, it seems, or it would appear, but it is very powerful because Power is evangelism is often a disruptive force for good. Everybody say for good. For good, power evangelism is often a disruptive force for good in the routine of our target, whoever it is, whoever it is. Now, this can often be a welcome disruption, right? especially among those that are oppressed, those that are down, those who have been broken by life, those who have been rejected. Maybe it's, maybe it's a divorce that happened in somebody's life. Maybe, you know, somebody lost a job. These are all broken people in those situations. So many other things, you know, maybe there's a tragedy, a loss, a death. Maybe, maybe you know, their investments went sour. It does, who knows? But, but the fact is, is that it can be a welcome disruption, especially among those who have been trapped by something outside their own power. Many times it's enslaving sin, it's sickness, it's disease as well. It can also be an unwelcomed disruption to people, especially the dunamis power of God. When these priests of Ta Wang, this idol on this island, when they heard the gospel, they were okay as long as the power of God didn't show up. The moment the rain came and it, it embarrassed them and it embarrassed the idol that they served, it was a terrible disruption. So they just decided to figure out a brand new day. Oh, we're just going to make something up now. But God loved them enough to disrupt their idol worship. Somebody say amen. amen. See, the leaders of the Tawang idol worship didn't want the gospel preached nor their followers to hear it, hear the gospel. It's very similar to another story in the Bible where Paul and Barnabas, remember on the first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13, here they are, they're preaching the gospel, they end up on the island of Cyprus, they have an audience with the governor of Cyprus, Sergius Paulus. And this governor wants to hear the gospel. Why? Because there's power associated with what Paul and Barnabas are preaching. What is this that is being said? What power of God is happening through their preaching? But there was a false prophet named Elamus, and he, he desired to keep the governor 
with, within his grasp of power. And so what did he do? What did he do? He tried to dissuade the governor from hearing the gospel while Paul and Barnabas are sharing the gospel with the governor. And so what did Paul do? Well, I guess I, we, just, we just can't get through. We just can't. No, what did he do? Remember the story? Paul looked at Elamus, and you can read what he says. It wasn't too kind. Woo, did he light Elamus up. He lit Elamus up. Why? Because God wanted Elamus to be saved, and he wanted the governor to be saved, and he wanted the gospel to open up on the island of Cyprus. And so Paul just looked at Elamus and said a whole bunch of things, and then he said, you will not see the light of day for a season. In other words, blindness came on him. Now, I'm not asking you to, to do that, but I'm just telling you this is the power of God we're dealing with, and people need to see demonstrations of the power of God. Woo! Hallelujah. And you are the angel-like messengers of God. That if you and I will get busy, somebody say amen. amen. People got all upset about the Grammy and all the devil worship on the stage. What do you expect from sinners? I say, I say we need to get busy casting out demons and, and quit being disgusted about sinners being sinners. Hallelujah. And so the gospel brings disruption, and bringing disruption is many times the plan of God. Somebody say amen. It's God's plan. It's God's plan. And guess what? Disrupting those who are just set on doing their own thing, that's just the way sinners are, or they're depressed. We can go from one spectrum to the other, or it can be good housewives, husbands. It can be all kinds of people, young adults, career, all of these things. They have aspiration, but they don't have God. They don't have God. How many know that God wants to bring disruption to them? Watchman Nee took initiative. He planned the event. He planned the outreach, and he caused, and his team caused loving disruption to the islanders belief system and that is what happened to me i was just on my way doing my own thing enjoying my life man and god started stepping in and disrupting all of the things that i liked and he started changing my mind about it and and people came into my life and preached the gospel you need to get saved what's saved i don't even know what that is i don't even know how to pray and people kept praying for me and finally finally all of that disruption and it disrupted me i'm telling you all of my friends changed my course in life changed when i got saved I, you know everything left that was a part of my life except for my family hallelujah but then i had a new, whole new family had a whole new set of values, and God began to use me. See, the boldness of this young convert brought disruption to the idol worship. He said, I promise you. <laughs> How did he have that boldness? Why did he have that boldness? How did he do that? Because he knew that the God of creation could make it rain on any day of the week. He already had that knowledge. We know that God is the creator of the universe. We know that he created this, the sun, moon, stars, the sky. We, he created this whole world in six days, rested on the seventh day. Somebody say amen. You and I are the evangelists. Say it with me. You and I are evangelists, the messengers of God, envoys in our day. And number three, and finally, let me close with this. Wow. Time went quick today. Power evangelism works when any of God's children work to break idolatry off of those they are seeking to win. Somebody say amen. You and I know people who have an idol in their life. They have, they have an idol of lifestyle. They have a, a sexual preference. They have an idol that they 
lift up in their own heart and they defy God with it. And so what is an idol? It is anything in your heart or in my heart or in my life that takes the place of God at the center of my life. You don't have to look too far for idol worship in America or in your friends. But when you become the idol breaker, when you want to become the idol breaker, I said, when you want to become the idol breaker, God will show and demonstrate the power that he has to destroy the idol in the person you're praying for. I'm about to shout and run. I, if I was 20 years old, I'd do it. I might slip a disc if I did it today. God loves a challenge. He loves a challenge. He looked at this young woo, not very old in the Lord. He said, what did I just hear? I, he might have said something like that. What did I hear? Woo said, angel said, Lord, he said that it's going to rain on the 11th. No, the Lord already heard it. He knows. He knows. He knew what Woo was doing. Somebody say, man, he put it in Woo. God's going to put things in you. Like I said, keys of the kingdom. The people need to see you operating at high levels of fun anointing, disruptive anointing. Hallelujah. It isn't just signs, miracles, and wonders. It can pertain to the sky. It can, it can pertain to anything that anyone has an idol. Anyone has, God, give me wisdom. I don't know what to say to this person that has this idol in their life. You have to identify it first. Notice they understood these islanders were worshiping this idol and it was hindering the gospel. Does that concern you? Power evangelism is about solving problems. Power evangelism is about discerning, is about being wise, is, is about uh, understanding what God is wanting to do. Not everybody gets saved the same way. Or can they, really? They, get, they come to the cross, but the fact is, is that some idols are very, very strong. These false deities, like this, de this false deity of Ta Wang. Breaking the power of idol worship takes the demonstration of God. So let me say this. Power evangelism, everybody say it again, power evangelism. People who walk in the power, angel-like messengers who walk in the power of God, Jen Gross up at the state capitol, hallelujah. I love what, I'll never forget Curtis's prayer on the house floor. I bind demons and witchcraft in this place. Hallelujah. I set them free, Lord. You got to go, you got to listen to it, man. I tell you, it was two minutes of power. It was just two minutes of flow and power on the capitol uh, uh, floor in Ohio. Hallelujah. Power evangelism is founded, listen, founded on extreme confidence in who God declares himself to be. Not who I say is, who he is, who he says he is. And so I'm not boasting in myself, I'm boasting in God. And when you throw challenges out like this young woo, I tell you, it's, it's, it's power. Just throw challenges out. Well, that's within the realm of God's power. So I guess, I guess I'll do that, Lord. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 16, verse 20 says this. And they went out and preached everywhere. They just started preaching. And the Lord, working with them, confirmed the word through accompanying signs. Has this ceased today? No, it has not. Do people need this demonstration? Yes. But our heart, our target has to be the lost. So what am I saying? I'm just saying this in conclusion. Where are my worship? Where is the worship team? Come on up here. Come on down. You are the next contestants. Oh, you, yeah, not the price is right. Oh, my goodness, my Siri just went off. I don't even know what happened there. But listen, signs, miracles, wonders, salvations, as the gospel is presented, 
is the will of God. Everybody say it with me. It is the will of God. And so these signs, miracles, conversions are supposed to be the norm. It's not to be abnormal. The church was never meant for liturgy and all of this formal false stuff. It's you and I coming into an upper room like this, being filled with power and going out wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, saying, God, what can I do for you? What can I do at work? Hallelujah. The Lord not only made it rain for these precious ones, and he did it to just destroy their idol, but he, he made, on the 11th, he made it rain on the 14th as well. Why? Because he, he loves the people. He loved the people and wanted them to know that he is God. He wanted them to know that he sent his son as Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are the angel-like messengers of the gospel and its power. In our day, how do you do these things? It should be, I don't want to make it complicated. I want it to be as natural as breathing. Remember what I said at the beginning of this message. I've always been fascinated about God's power. He has always fascinated me. And though I went to Bible college, then the Bible college, I really didn't believe in a whole lot of miracle signs and wonders. It never dampened my desire to know God for who he says he is instead of what people says he is, say he is. Christians are called. Let me give you some concluding thoughts. Bring those lights down. Christians are called to create opportunities. Opportunities for people to believe, for God to work. Opportunities for God to work. So, you might be around some people tonight. You might be around people that are lost, people that, you know, may have too much to drink. They, they, they may not know God. Why not just demonstrate the power of God? Is any sick among you? You're an elder of the church. I ordain you an elder of the church. Lay hands on the sick. Believing prayer begins it all. You and I are called to create those opportunities that God wants to bring His glory into. Stand with me right now. Oh, that sounds so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. All right. It's 1215. Bow your heads right now. Father, I thank you that you are making strong and mighty witnesses of the gospel here. That you are making strong and mighty witnesses. Those who are filled with faith and who operate in power and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I want you to make this declaration. Just repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your dunamis, your power that accompanies the presentation of the gospel. Thank you that you have empowered me through your Holy Spirit with boldness and fearlessness to share the good news of Jesus. Today, I pray that you make me your instrument of evangelism. Make me an angel-like messenger of your power. I will take initiative with those around me. I will pray for them. I will plan to consistently reach out to them in love. I will be a disruptor for good in their life because you love them. I will be an idol breaker and an opportunity maker for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Are you glad you came this morning? Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name still. 
call the sea to still the raging.